Okay, uh, I know we're running a few minutes behind, so we'll jump right into our next presentation now. Uh, Dr. Dominika Gidrovich is a pediatric gastroenterologist with a community practice at the South Health, South Health Campus of Alberta Health Services in Calgary. Her research interest is studying celiac disease in children, and her ongoing study examines the role of serology in the diagnosis of celiac disease and follow-up after starting a gluten-free diet. She's a member of the CCA's Professional Advisory Council. Dominika, it's all yours. Great, Mark. Thank you very much. So let me share my screen and start my presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to the CCA and, sorry, and Mark for um, uh, inviting me to speak on uh, celiac disease. So over the next 30 minutes, I will discuss the diagnosis and management of celiac disease, and I'll cover the topics described below. And so though I am a pediatric gastroenterologist, and this is the lens through which I see my celiac patients, many of the topics that I will discuss today are equally relevant to adults with celiac disease. So to jump right in, um, I wanted to start with genetics. And so we know that celiac disease has a very strong hereditary component with 75% of identical or what we call monozygotic uh, twins being affected. We know that the best characterized uh, risk genes are the HLA DQ2 and DQ8 genes, and those are genes that are essential to the regulation of the immune response. We also know that 95, um, up to even 99% of celiac patients are um, positive for DQ2 and or DQ8. I think there's a couple important points to make here that 30% of the general population are also positive for the DQ2 uh, gene. And furthermore, when you screen first degree relatives, up to 80% of them are positive for DQ2 or DQ8. So what we understand now is that genetics are very necessary to develop celiac disease, but they're not sufficient. And so there are other immune uh, regulatory genes, maybe and environmental factors that are at play in developing celiac. So moving on now to serology, I wanted to review the history of some of our testing of celiac disease and highlight some important points about each test. So in 1983, the antiglide and antibodies were discovered. And this, in fact, is an antibody against a nutritional protein, the glidin. And so unlike the other serology tests, it is not actually an auto auto antibody. And so the antiglidin antibodies, which you've heard earlier uh, about today, they can appear in normal controls, they increase with age, they are gluten dependent, and they can sh be shared between many GI and autoimmune conditions. Um, and then also in 1983, the anti-endomesial antibody was discovered, and we refer to that as a short form EMA. And this antibody is directed against a component of the intestinal smooth muscle. And here I have a diagram of what that test uh, looks like. It is reported as a titer. And what happens is the, the blood sample is stained onto the smooth muscle sample, and then a lab technician will wash the slide to dilute uh, the sample uh, to determine how many dilutions before the signal disappears. I think of it almost like a drop of paint and how many times does it need to be diluted. And so the EMA is very specific for celiac, however, it has some drawbacks. It is uh, less reliable in children less than two, maybe the elderly, and also it is uh, not uh, likely positive in individuals who have milder intestinal injuries. And then moving on, in 1997 was the big discovery of the tissue transglutaminase antibody, which is currently our main celiac serology that, that we order, and I will speak more on this in the next slide. Uh, and then in 2001, the anti-diamided glidin uh, peptide was discovered. You've heard about that already today. And this is an antibody to this diaminated glidin peptide antigen. And this is the protein in, in the intestinal form um, that is diaminated by TTG. And this is the protein that starts 
the inflammatory cascade. So as I mentioned, the IgA TTG is the main serolo celiac serology that we ordered today. And there are certain very important things to remember when this test is being ordered. The first one, and very important, <coughs> pardon me, is that the patient has to be, the person has to be eating gluten in order to be doing this test. And it also relies on the presence of what we call a sufficient IgA antibody. IgA antibodies, a antibody our, uh, our bodies make. And in some individuals, they have low or um, deficient IgA levels. And so therefore, the IgA TTG would not be a reliable test. And there's another test that can be done in those people. And both adult and pediatric celiac guidelines recommend that that the total IgA and the IgA TTG are the single best tests that we should start with to detect celiac disease at any age. And so what I've uh, underlined there though is that the caveat is that there, are a, there is a lot of interlaboratory variability with regards to the TTG and there are numerous TTG kits avail available across the world. So this table here ha was taken from the 2012 Pediatric Celiac Disease Guidelines, the references below there. And it, here what they did is they studied 14 different TTG kits. And those are uh, that you can see there on the first column. And each TTG kit was tested against three samples, sample one, two, and three. And I'd like to draw your attention to sample three. Now that was the high, uh, high positive sample. And the last row in this table here uh, shows you, uh, sorry, the last, call, uh, the last row in this table shows you the reference kit, uh, the Varelyza one, and that uh, was the reference kit. And you can see that on the bottom right that it, that, that sample three tested 10 times above the upper limit of normal for that kit. But as you can see in the sample three, that the other kits that were used to test against that same sample generated quite different results. First of all, the baseline result was quite different. Uh, and then also the value above the upper limit of normal was also very different. So I think this is uh, an important uh, thing to understand. For example, if a person has a, a celiac screen performed in one province and then they move, those are different kits that are done between different laboratories. And in a city, a uh, big city such as Toronto, there'll be different laboratories that have different kits. So this is quite an important uh, concept to, to, to be aware of. What I wanted to move on to as well is that I've, I've highlighted that the TTG is a great test, but again, it's not perfect. People need to understand that there are some reasons why that test might be what we call falsely positive. It's positive, but the person doesn't actually have celiac disease. Um, one of the main causes of a false positive test is if somebody has an acute uh, intestinal infection at the time. So for example, you might have stomach pain, diarrhea, somebody does the celiac screen, but in, in fact, those symptoms are related to an infection. That could cause a false positive. Other causes of false positive are other autoimmune conditions. Some of those I've listed here. And in particular, what I see very commonly are my patients with type 1 diabetes who get celiac screens and in those cases they may in fact have a false positive screen. You could also have a false positive screen from a lab error. And now the opposite is true too. You may have a false negative test and the, I've already mentioned that you need to be eating gluten in order to do a TTG test and so a diet that's low in gluten may give a false negative test. Um, children under two years of age uh, may not give a very reliable celiac screen. And I've already mentioned too that in patients who have a selective IgA deficiency would not have a reliable IgA TTG screen. And moving on, I wanted to review this imp important study because I've mentioned to you how a positive TTG does not automatically equal celiac disease. I think that's the main message that I want to highlight here. So this was a study uh, that was recently published in 2019 in a major um, medical journal called Gastroenterology. And in this Italian study, they had 280 children who were followed for up to nine years. And each of those children to be enrolled in the study, they had two consecutive positive TTGs and a normal intestinal biopsy at the start. 
And then the children continued to eat gluten and they had repeat serology every six months and in fact, a repeat biopsy every two years. So quite tremendously closely followed. And what I'd like to highlight from this study is that the CENIAC screen became negative in 32% of those children. So having a positive celiac screen does not automatically mean a person has celiac disease and they really need to be evaluated by a skilled physician to determine the next appropriate step. And so if somebody does have a positive celiac screen, the next step may be to go on to do an upper endoscopy uh, to confirm the diagnosis. And I'll just run through this procedure uh, that I do and that uh, so during this test, and in children, we do this test with them uh, asleep, it, it, we have a camera that we call the endoscope, and that is basically a camera on a long black cord that is attached to a flat screen TV. And that camera, that cord camera is in, advanced uh, through the mouth, down the swallowing tube, we call that the esophagus, and then into the stomach and the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, and that is where the changes with celiac disease are noted. And so this uh, camera can take pictures, and then through the scope, we can also put little biopsy forceps to take little tissue samples. Usually this test typically takes at most um, uh, 15 minutes to do, uh, in addition to the time that it takes to put the patient to sleep. And so here are some pictures of what a uh, duodenum look like. So on the left is a picture of a normal duodenum. So uh, the picture shows uh, nice tall villi. They're kind of folded over onto each other. And for kids, I usually describe this as if those um, anemone that Nemo swims through. So nice tall villi. And then on the right is a picture of a duodenum from someone who has quite uh, severe celiac disease. And some of the typical features we would see are these areas of scalloping. So those are areas where uh, the villi are very blunted and then you can see that that would be the what we would um, what we would see. And then moving on if we when we take biopsies we uh, send them off to the pathologist and the pathologist use very specific criteria and look for very specific features for celiac disease. So the picture on the left uh, uh, where it says zero underneath, we use the modified Marsh criteria to grade the biopsies. So the picture on the left there shows nice tall villi and the villi, so on the bottom you can see how that correlates to uh, the, these little black dots would be intrapathial lymphocytes and so you have nice tall villi with a few uh, lymphocytes in them. And then Marsh 1, the criteria, that means that there are increased number of intrapathelial lymphocytes greater than 25 per 100 uh, enterocytes. Marsh 2, you can notice that the density of this tissue here is much, much more. There's a lot more inflammatory cells there. And then Marsh 3A, B, and C, progressively the villi become flatter, whereby Marsh 3C is where the villi are uh, completely flat. So when uh, biopsies are reported, they sometimes report them with these different Marsh criteria or other times the pathologists are more descriptive and they describe the, the lymphocytes, the villus blunting, and, and what we call here the lamina propria cellularity. And so what I wanted to move on to now is though I wanted to touch on a little bit that there are in some scenarios patients where we may not in fact need to proceed with a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. And so these non-biopsy or what we call uh, serologic criteria were first presented by the European Society for Pediatric GI, Hepatology and Nutrition, and for short, we call that ESPAGAN. And they were first presented in 2012, and now more recently, they were revised in 2019. Again, those references are below. And there are four criteria, now there are three, and I'll run you through them. So the first criteria is that the patient, and, and these are in fact pediatric criteria, so the child should have symptoms of celiac. Um, and that's important for a few reasons. One is that then you can follow these symptoms after starting the gluten-free diet to make sure they resolve. 
And sec the second criteria is that the TTG should be over 10 times the upper limit of the reference value. And as I've highlighted in the previous table there that I showed you, the performance of, that t of these TTG assays can be quite variable. So sometimes it is challenging to apply these serologic criteria in cities, for example, where you have a variety of labs with different DT TTG kits. The third criteria is that the patient should have a positive EMA on a second blood sample. And again, the, this EMA test is not universally performed by every laboratory. So that would be another reason why potentially in some places uh, a non-biopsy diagnosis could not be applied. And the fourth criteria, which was originally presented in the 2012 guidelines, was that the patient needed to have documentation of the positive HLA, DQ2, or DQ8 genetics. And in fact, this is no longer part of the 2019 criteria. Um, what we see is that if the patients meet the first three criteria, the serologic criteria, that having the positive genetics really doesn't add much more. And so uh, if the patient meets these three criteria, then the option of emitting a biopsy can be discussed with the family. Some families feel quite relieved knowing that their physician's 100% sure that their child has celiac disease and other families would still like to proceed with a biopsy. So that's always a discussion that I have in the clinic. And then of course, after um, the patient needs to be followed um, to see the response to the gluten-free diet and the resolution of the symptoms. I'll just briefly address what we've been doing through the COVID pandemic, um, where elective endoscopies have been postponed right now. So in some patients, we have been adopting this. So I've been, I adopt the serologic criteria quite often in patients who meet the criteria in Calgary, and we've been doing it a little bit maybe more commonly now also, um, and then deciding after the pandemic is over and our endoscopy procedures resume, whether the patient needs to have a gluten challenge to do endoscopy. And so though what I've highlighted there is some of the steps that we take through the diagnosis, uh, serology, biopsy, and potentially uh, serologic diagnosis. And what I'd like to cover now are some of the important um, things that I liked that I cover when I see my patients in follow-up in the clinic. So certainly talking about their nutrition, adherence to the gluten-free diet, discussing their symptoms, uh, reviewing the serology and follow-up, and then screening for associated conditions. So there are some important considerations for patients on a gluten-free diet. Uh, there are things that patients may be deficient in. Um, in the green bar there, they can have a, a diet that is quite low in fiber. In the blue, some patients may uh, be not eating enough calcium due to transient lactose intolerance or vitamin D uh, deficiency, for example. And the other important consideration is that processed gluten-free foods may be higher in simple sugars and fats. And so if patients consume a lot of those processed foods, then they may have a very high fat diet. So uh, reviewing this is quite important. What I see very commonly in my pediatric practice is constipation in, in children's on a gluten-free diet. And so constipation may be actually a presenting symptom of celiac disease. We know that about 8% of children may present with constipation as their only symptom at diagnosis. And then it may be a symptom afterwards too. The two tables I've shown you here, they are from the Alberta Health Services uh, website. I've written the website down below. If in the search field you Google, uh, you search gluten, you will find the fiber and the gluten-free diet handout. And so what I like to highlight to patients is how much fiber they should be eating in their diet. And um, typically for um, my female, female patients, it's about 25 grams a day. And then for males, it even uh, teenage males, it increases up to 31. And then patients always ask, well, what does that really mean? And then so then I'd like to highlight the next uh, part here, which is a, a little um, crop I took from, from this, from this uh, handout. And I show them that, you know, half a cup of broccoli has two grams of fiber. So that would be a lot of broccoli if that was the only source of fiber uh, a patient was eating. And I think what this highlights is people start to understand that just having a little bit of vegetables a day isn't going to meet 
fiber requirements that really patients need to eat a variety of high fiber foods um, such as uh, high fiber grains, chia seeds, flax seeds, and quinoa, for example. And so this is a very good uh, handout that you can uh, that you can look up to have the complete list of different foods that can be offered. Um, and I talk about constipation commonly with, with my patients because they do present uh, back and follow up with new onset abdominal pain. And this is something that we discuss. Moving on to some, some other nutritional important aspects. So uh, at diagnosis, we know that um, patients can have iron deficiency related to an absorption, poor absorption of iron from the villus blunting. They can have iron deficiency anemia, folate deficiencies, B12 deficiencies, and uh, as you can see, vitamin D deficiencies. But what has been shown in follow-up is that patients uh, of the other deficiencies, they, they do improve to a large extent, but the vitamin D deficiency um, has been shown to be quite common and persist, and, and, persist, and especially uh, living in Canada with quite long winters. This is a common, uh, this is a, a common problem among uh, Canadians. And this leads into bone health in celiac disease. And there where vitamin D is quite an important factor for absorption of calcium uh, in the intestines. And so there are so many factors at diagnosis in patients with celiac disease that would affect their bone health. Um, as I mentioned, they may not be absorbing their nutrients because of the villus blunting. In fact, the inflammation in the bowels causes leaching of calcium from their bones. They may be undernourished because they can't simply eat as well. Uh, and they may have lifestyle variables, such as if you're in a, in a lot of abdominal pain or have diarrhea, then you may not be as physically active. So, so many factors, uh, a diagnosis where a patient may have effects on their bone health. So what I like to review during the follow-up visits is firstly to highlight that, especially in children, and this is that the gluten-free diet really helps to restore the bone health. And I uh, discussed that they should be eat, uh, consuming sufficient amount of calcium in uh, prepubertal children's usually 1,000 milligrams a day and during pubertal children, 1,300 milligrams. And there are good handouts on calcium intake as well. I review their vitamin D intake and encourage them to take vitamin D regularly and promote exercise to restore that bone health. And there are good guidelines on uh, measuring bone mineral density, and that is not something that's routinely done in children and really not so much routinely recommended either in adults unless an adult presents with a lot of weight loss or diarrhea. I do order a bone mineral density in some select patients who may not adhere to the gluten-free diet carefully and that I worry about their ongoing bone health. Moving on now to the symptoms and discussing symptom resolution uh, in the follow-up visits, um, there has been some research looking at the rates of improvements of extraintestinal features after starting a gluten-free diet, and the reference is below there too. The blue bars are pediatric patients in the study, and the red bars were the adult patients. And as you can see, and the uh, y-axis shows the percentage of of patients who had improvement of these symptoms. So on the left side of this graph, you can see that some symptoms such as dermatitis herpetiformis, which is a very uh, characteristic rash in celiac disease or mouth sores, improve in up to 100% uh, of children while other symptoms, such as the ones on more the right side of the graph, such as headaches, improve about 55% uh, of children. So there's some uh, knowledge that we're gaining in terms of which symptoms at the time of diagnosis are likely to improve with a gluten-free diet. And so then when a patient presents to the clinic and they're on a gluten-free diet, but they have persistent symptoms, there are a list of things that I think about and try to rule out to figure out what the cause of that is. And the first and the most common reason really is accidental gluten exposure and um, checking the celiac screen may be a, a helpful first step in that scenario. But there are other causes that I think about. So for example, uh, patients may have lactose intolerance. Um, when I mentioned before the secondary lactose intolerance, when you have villus blunting or flattening of your villi in the intestine, then you actually can't absorb uh, 
the glucose very well. You don't have a lot of lactase enzymes, and that may lead to lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance can present with diarrhea, abdominal pain, and flatulence. I also think about whether the patient may have small bowel and small bowel bacterial overgrowth, and that can present with bloating and diarrhea. The condition of microscopic colitis is one that presents with a very profuse, uh, non-bloody diarrhea. It is more commonly an adult diagnosis in uh, females and it, um, is associated with celiac disease. I think about whether there, this is a presentation of another autoimmune condition such as Crohn's disease and I try to use the history and physical exam to try to sort that out and possibly additional blood work. And then finally, I think could this patient, in fact, be experiencing celiac disease and irritable bowel syndrome? So we know that there's a crossover between celiac and irritable bowel syndrome. So children with IBS have a fourfold higher prevalence of celiac disease. And the converse, 30% of patients with celiac disease who adhere strictly to a gluten-free diet also have IBS symptoms. And the, the thought is that the intestinal nerves uh, in that area of the intestine that was inflamed before with celiac disease uh, are sensitized, and we call this visceral hypersensitivity. And I think this is quite an important thing to think about as well, and asking patients whether they notice uh, stressors, for example, or exacerbating their symptoms. And we know that the increased prevalence of irritable bowel syndrome in patients with celiac disease is regardless of their adherence to the gluten-free diet. Now moving on to follow-up serology, that is something that is commonly done. Uh, if follow-up visits, it is important to uh, be monitoring patients on a gluten-free diet, and we do this both in children and in adults. And here's a study where we had patients that, we were, that were retrospectively, so looking back through their charts, um, they were categorized in terms of what, how high their celiac screens were at diagnosis. So the, the black line were patients with the highest celiac screens. And then the hashed gray line were those with lower TTGs and negative EMAs. And the x-axis shows you time since starting gluten-free diet. And the y-axis shows you the number of patients who still had a positive TTG. And so what I've tried to highlight here with the yellow lines is that you can see that at that 50% of the patients still had a positive TTG at 20 months if they were in the very high serology group, the black group, the black line group. And so I use this data to help inform my patients that, yes, I do expect your TTG to drop every time we measure it on consecutive measurements, but, the, but in some scenarios, it could even take up to three years to normalize if your blood work was really high at the time of your diagnosis. And I try to ease any anxiety in the patients because some sometimes people expect the serology to be normal after six months and that may not really be the, the case. It will take time. And then moving on to uh, the final uh, sort of consideration when I in follow-up is thinking about uh, celiac disease and associated conditions. So here we know that celiac disease is a genetic condition. We uh, see it more commonly in first degree relatives. And there's been good studies looking at um, relatives and the relationship to the index case and how the rate of celiac disease, um, how high that rate is. And so we see, we know that celiac disease is more common in siblings of the index case, that first patient in the, in the family, and also female siblings. So it may be even up to as high as uh, 10 to 15 percent, and then the rate is less, less common in other uh, first degree relatives, but still higher than the population rate of about 1 percent. So what, how this is important is first I tell my families that, well, 85 uh, percent likely that the other first degree relatives are not likely to have celiac disease, and which is why I don't typically recommend that the whole household simply go gluten-free. But what I do recommend is that every first-degree relative is screened for celiac disease. I usually um, suggest screening over the age of three. So if there's younger siblings, we typically suggest waiting till they're over three, or if they're younger than three and have symptoms that are concerning. And the second thing that I 
discusses that maybe it's worthwhile considering rescreening first degree relatives every two to three years if they're asymptomatic. But this is there are no guidelines yet on how frequently uh, first degree relatives should be rescreened. And we also know that celiac, uh, patients with celiac disease are at increased risk of other autoimmune conditions, and that's important in ongoing monitoring. So 35% of celiac patients may have other autoimmune conditions. Um, and the thyroid, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease is the most common one. And so in patients who just have thyroid disease, about 2.7 or almost 3% have celiac. And conversely, in patients who have celiac, there's an increased lifetime prevalence of thyroid, thyroid, thyroiditis. And so at diagnosis, it's important to measure a thyroid screen. We call that a TSH. And then if the TSH is normal, then I typically repeat it annually for uh, two to three years. And if it stays normal, then that screening can be stretched out for the TSH. And then the um, psoriasis can be commonly associated with celiac disease. Uh, type 1 diabetes uh, can be also commonly associated with celiac. So patients who have type 1 diabetes, they are regularly screened for celiac or for the first few years after their diagnosis. Typically, patients are diagnosed first with type 1 and then celiac. And uh, there are no guidelines at this time in terms of uh, screening for diabetes in patients with celiac disease. So what I typically do in follow-up visits is discuss the symptoms of type 1 with my patients, and those symptoms include drinking excessive fluids, waking up at night to frequently void, feeling more fatigued, and weight loss. And in those scenarios, the patients would have their glucose checked. Sjogren's syndrome is a condition of dry eyes and dry mouth, also more commonly associated with celiac disease. What I'd like to uh, point out is there are some excellent resources on the CCA website, and this is under the uh, professional resources. So here, there's a handout here for physicians on what to do in managing patients with celiac disease and follow-up. And uh, there are six key elements that are highlighted. And then the second page of this handout goes through what steps and at what time frame pa patients with celiac disease should be monitored and what they should have done at those different visits. So excellent handout. I like to give this handout to my uh, teenagers who are transitioning from my practice to their family doctor, for example, and then they can be informed and advocate for themselves. And you'll find this on the CCA website. So in summary, I hope I've uh, highlighted that at diagnosis, the best test to start, and this is across guidelines for children and adults, is a total IgA and IgA TTG. There are many other screens that are available, but this is really the best one to start with. Uh, I've discussed that some children may qualify for diagnosis without a biopsy. There are specific scenarios it, that that may be applied. And then in follow-up, it is important to talk about fiber intake, vitamin D, calcium intake. And then if your symptoms don't resolve after you go on a gluten-free diet, it's important to discuss that with your doctor because there are a list of other considerations that your doctor will think about. Uh, Follow-up serology post the diagnosis can take time to normalize, and that's really important to understand that it should drop, but that rate of drop may vary, especially if you started with really high blood work at diagnosis. Um, patients should be monitored for those associated conditions, and you can reference the handout on the CCA website for that monitoring. And I hope I've highlighted for you also that meeting with a registered dietitian is important because of those different nutritional factors that I mentioned. And then you can find some excellent resources on the CCA website for, and we're here to, for your ongoing support. So thank you so much for, for allowing me to present to, to you and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Dominica. Uh, we'll first uh, do some more prize giveaways. Nairns are a delicious and healthy option for celiacs using the goodness and nutrition of gluten-free oats. Their gluten-free product line includes crackers, cookies, and flatbreads. They're certified with the gluten-free certification program too. Their prize pack includes a box of each of their gluten-free products. We're giving away three of these, each with a value of $30. The winners are Anita Navrocki from Edmonton, Alberta, Cheryl Colbert from Chilliwack, British Columbia, and Kyla Teese from Regina, Saskatchewan. Congratulations.
So for uh, questions and answers, uh, we're pretty uh, uh, behind schedule, so I'm going to streamline this a bit. Um, but Dominica, so if uh, if someone has a child with uh, biopsy confirmed celiac, say their daughter is celiac and their son is, is positive on the blood test but has a negative biopsy, should he still go on the gluten-free diet? Like some parents are re understandably reluctant to push their children into eating gluten when they get debilitating symptoms. Uh, that's an excellent question, Mark. So um, it depends. I th I think it depends how high the other children, the other the son, for example, the other siblings' blood work was. It um, depends if also as you as I showed you those pictures of the intestine. We take little samples of it, and um, so the d the celiac disease affects the intestines in a patchy way. So possibly, um, you know, the biopsies may have missed it if if there weren't enough taken. So those are a few kind of. Uh, technical considerations. Um, and I generally do not recommend the gluten-free diet in a patient who does not have a confirmed diagnosis either by biopsy or by blood work, because this is a lifelong consideration. It is, as as many of you know, it's expensive. It's, it's, it's something you think about every time. And in somebody who doesn't have such a 100% confirmed diagnosis, and then they may start to lax on their diet over the years, when in fact they end up having celiac disease, that becomes quite unclear. And that may even, in fact, delay a proper diagnosis in the future. So generally, if the patient had a, a good intestinal biopsy and sufficient samples were taken, then and that bo those biopsies were all negative, then I would follow the patient with their blood work uh, every six months to a year, for example, to figure out, does that blood work actually go to normal, such as the study that I showed you from the Italian group, where 32% of them actually went down to normal and they didn't end up having celiac disease. They only had autoantibody positivity. Well, that's interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Um, next question, can you be born with celiac? Like, and can an infant start showing signs of celiac disease prior to the introduction of solids? In this case, the mom has celiac and is concerned with the baby's low weight percentile. So celiac disease develops when you ingest gluten, and that gluten then uh, causes an autoimmune reaction in the intestines. So in that case, if the patient's not ingesting gluten, you wouldn't be able to develop celiac at that point. You are born with the genetics, so you may be born with a genetic predisposition. So in a young child who's not growing well, there are really a long list of possibilities that a pediatrician or a pediatric gastroenterologist would think about um, and not maybe jump immediately to a diagnosis of or testing for celiac disease right away because really you need to be ingesting gluten in order to cause that autoimmune reaction at the intestinal level. And I understand, I, as far as I know, uh, yeah, gluten can't be passed through breast milk. Mark, I think you're right, but I, I, um, there, there are. I don't know of data to show that 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 would that would be the case, and that would cause intestinal inflammation. And in my practice, really, the youngest patient I have had to be diagnosed with celiac was around 18 months, and so you would think that the child then first began eating gluten probably around six months with solid food introduction. And then with some time that intestinal inflammation developed and they presented with symptoms. Right. And you spoke about uh, the number of the uh, correlations between celiac disease and a number of ailments. Um, could you comment a bit on, uh, could there be links between celiac disease and autism or ADHD or learning disabilities generally? So uh, there, the, the, all, all of those that you mentioned are common in the general population. And, and when you have something that's like celiac disease affects 1% of the population and another common condition, you may have somebody ha who has those two together. So um, there, there, isn't a, um, a, there isn't any evidence to show that there's a strong correlation between those. But what I see in my practice, especially in quite young children, five, six, and seven, where they may have difficulty expressing some of the GI symptoms they're experiencing, whether it's bloating or grumbling in their tummy, and then that may affect, for example, their ability to focus at school, their ability to pay attention. And so they may be diagnosed with ADHD because they're having a lot of difficulty focusing, but that issue actually comes from the fact that they're not feeling very well, but are having trouble expressing that. So it's, um, so it's important to, 
there isn't a correlation in, in research that between those conditions, but sometimes young children may have difficulty expressing some of their uh, GI symptoms and may present otherwise with behavioral outbursts or, AD or attention issues. The question we get a lot is, uh, do parents need to worry about having gluten-free shampoos, sunscreens, et cetera, for their children? Oh, Mark, this is a fantastic question because we have just written a, um, we have just written a, a document and it's found on the CCA website. Uh, I reviewed some recent data looking at cosmetics and the answer is no. So uh, first of all, in studies that have looked at cosmetics, the very, very, very few of them have any detectable gluten. So that's the first point. Toothpaste, for example, um, many of them are gluten-free. So many of those cosmetics have undetectable gluten. The second point is that you will not develop an intestinal reaction unless you actually ingest it. So if you're washing your hair and then rinsing it without ingesting the shampoo, then that is, there's no way for that gluten to cause a reaction in your intestines. Same with, for example, cream on your skin would not travel through the skin into your intestines. So both the cosmetics uh, have very little detectable gluten. And secondly, uh, you're not ingesting it. And for if you want to read on the full statement of that, that can be found on the CCA website. And uh, this will be the last question. What do you tell an asymptomatic child who insists that they feel fine and should be able to enjoy that school pizza party or whatever? That's also a great question, which comes up often. And I didn't go through this, but about up to 20% of patients are asymptomatic. And that is actually a more common scenario also in, in when uh, first degree relatives are screened. Often those first degree relatives could be asymptomatic. What I, what I show the patients are some of the pictures I showed you. I show them pictures of their intestines, some pictures of intestines, not theirs maybe particularly, but pictures of intestines, what could be happening, and the villus blunting. And also I discuss with them that this intestinal inflammation will affect how you absorb nutrients. You're not going to automatically feel the fact that your bones are thinner and weaker until you break a bone at some point. So I try to explain to them that there are some symptoms like the bone health that you may not feel right away. Or for example, if you're not growing as well, that will take months to years to present. But those are symptoms that could be ongoing uh, in the patient. And I work with those patients regularly to really help them appreciate why it's so important to uh, stay to be gluten-free. Okay, we'll have to end it there. Thanks so very much for taking the time to speak with us today, Dominique. I know we, everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're at the uh, top of the hour or the bottom of the hour in Newfoundland. Uh, we're going to move into a break shortly, uh, sponsored by M&M Food Market. Uh, M&M Food Market uh, offers a wide selection of uh, expertly frozen food and delicious options for any mealtime. From appetizers and desserts to prepared meals and sides, M&M Food Market has you covered. With 340 locations across Canada, you can visit your local store or shop online at mmfoodmarket.com for free same-day pickup. M&M Food Market is a great source for a wide array of certified gluten-free products. Uh, some of my favorite products, they have uh, the breaded chicken fillets, cabbage rolls, and for dessert, uh, their two tall cakes, and a peanut butter and jam squares I love. How do we create... Uh, we're going to start with a giveaway of, an, of a $50 M&M Food Market gift card that they have kindly donated. And the winner for that is Sue Walker from Amherst, Nova Scotia. Congratulations. And we're going to move into a video for the break. And we're going to shorten uh, this break as well to uh, five minutes. So uh, seven minutes uh, past.